we're ready to go. Hello, my name is Wayne Calk. Uh, I was born and then here I am. No, <laughs> I was born in Del Rio, Texas and uh, to uh, parents that were, uh, my father was a railroad uh, building, a uh, bridge builder and my mother was a teacher and uh, had a brother, a brother Max, and then I had two half-sisters, Bernice and Peggy. And uh, I guess two of those, the mo mom and pop, uh, were influential in their own ways, kind of in a minor way about my cooking, in that uh, mother was a school teacher. She would get us up and, you know, we'd start off with oatmeal, which I hated, and we would have oatmeal every day. And, uh, but, you know, it progressed. Uh, she did other things. She did Mexican cornbread. She did chicken fried steak. She did fried chicken, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And it was just kind of through osmosis that I picked up from her those sort of things. And I think I learned fundamentally how to make gravy from her by not just mom show me how to make gravy, just watching and seeing that, you know, common sense tells you you need to add this or don't add too much of that, and then it kind of comes out all right. And, uh, you know, I didn't get into cooking. I just, that knowledge was there, kind of waiting to get some, uh, get some water and feed it so that it'll grow. And then my dad, he would come home on the weekends from the railroad, being out on the job. And uh, when we were little kids, my brother and I, we would go out on the gang. He had about 16 men that worked under him. They would build bridges and whenever a bridge would get washed out, they'd rebuild it and so forth. Anyway, he would stay out there on the gang and they had a commissary and they cooked for them and so forth. But he his quarters were was a box car that was converted to living quarters. And he had a high shelf that had a two burner stove on it. And he had a, you know, an old cast iron skillet in it. And, uh, when he got ready to cook, it was, I mean, it was quick. In five minutes, he would fix breakfast for the four of us and just don't get in his way. And it was usually bacon and eggs and sugar toast. And uh, boy, it went fast. <laughs> I don't know, he had it down to a science because you just didn't spend much time cooking and, and that sort of thing. But I think that speed of cooking and so forth is something else I kind of got through osmosis and uh, just watching him and so forth. But uh, as I was growing up, I went to, uh, uh, to middle school and I was in my first industrial arts class uh, in the eighth grade with, with a gentleman by the name of Glenn Benson. And uh, after I went through class and so forth, we became fast friends after I got out of high school and college and we were friends for 50 something years. But he was very, very influential in, in what I learned about cooking and, and a lot of uh, fried foods and things about don't be afraid to try something and and uh, uh, his, his was unique in that he used a lot of cast iron, uh, a lot of implements and things that that he used, he built, whether it was a deep fryer or uh, some kind of a griddle or something, but uh, uh, Glenn passed away a few years ago, but uh, toward the end of, of his life, uh, I had gotten the opportunity to do a, uh, take my chuck wagon down into South Texas and cook for a hunting camp for, I don't know, we did that three, four, five years. And Glenn came out from Del Rio and helped us cook, and I got to spend some really, really special time with him, and uh, that meant the world to me. And uh, and, uh, and I, I, I reminisce about it, but I remember one time our whole camp got blown away, and we were trying to cook in the wind, and <laughs> we literally had to put horseshoes on our tortillas to keep them from blowing away. And uh, the hunters weren't weren't too happy about it, but uh, we weren't. <laughs> we weren't too concerned about them other than just getting them something hot to eat. But uh, I, I, let me go back a little bit. After 
after high school, uh, I went to to Sol Ross uh, University in Alpine, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to major in. My brother had already been there and and was just about to graduate when I got there, and I thought, well, what am I going to do? My counselor had already told me in high school that, you know, I'd be wasting my money if I went to to college anyway. So, you know, you need to think about something else. But I foxed him and uh, went to college. I majored in business. And then I got into an accounting class. And uh, I remember me and accounting wrestled around quite a bit. And I went up to the department chair, Ms. K. And I said, Ms. K, how naive I was. I said, do you have to have accounting to major in business? She said, yes, Wayne. <laughs> and I said, thank you, Miss Kay. So I went downstairs. That was on the third floor at Sol Ross. And went down and I ran into my friend, Bobo McCarson from Comstock. And I said, dang, Bobo, I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, well, why don't you major in shop? And I said, shop, what's that? He said, you know, woodworking, metalworking, photography and all that stuff. I said, hmm, you major in that? I said, yeah, you can even get a job and teach it. I said, wow, that's cool. So I went over and there was a new gentleman in the department by the name of Bill Levitt, and I talked to him and he convinced me that this was the way to go and I could tell you stories about him, but uh, uh, he, was, he was influential in my life in a lot of ways that, uh, other than cooking. Um, after college, well, I'll take that back to old, Oh, Bobo McCarson. Uh, somebody had given us some some caribou and said, "Y'all want some caribou?" He said, yeah, yeah. We, you know, we we were always looking for something to fix other than what was in the cafeteria. And they said, "How do you fix it?" And they said, "Well, you can just season it any way you want to. You can't get too much salt on it." I said, "Well, that's a clear view there. We'll just uh, we'll grill us some barbecue us some caribou." So we put pretty goodly amount of salt in it and cooked it outside and when we thought it was over we tasted it and oh my god it was horrible it was so bad we couldn't eat it and it was even worse than that we threw it out the back door because there were several dogs that lived where the apartments were that we lived the, the dogs didn't even eat it it was really really bad but he taught me a few things about cooking, uh, about fideo and, and you know, some other simple things, but uh, that kind of started stirring me up and wanting to cook. And uh, and then I got, uh, got a teaching job over in Kermit and uh, I taught there for eight years and, and uh, was kind of, kind of getting anxious to do something else. And and uh, my superintendent called the superintendent here and in El Paso, uh, Dr. Hanks, and he said, well, why don't you give Wayne a job teaching over or teaching industrial arts over And he said, okay, I'll give him, tell him come on over. So, okay, I came over. And anyway, I got a job and met a, met a friend of mine that was in college a little before me uh, named Jamie Cardwell. And, uh, oh, we were here, I was here in El Paso for a good while. And then we were both in administration and we had a lot of uh, school organizations, FFA, the junior ROTC, all sorts of different organizations that always have a banquet at the end of the year and they needed somebody to cook for the banquet. And uh, they usually didn't have very much money so we just thought we, we would do it and we would be able to save them money by cooking for them and we started off doing it for just whatever it cost us to to feed them. And then that kind of turned into a, a thing where other people would say, hey, would y'all cater for us? And sure. And then we started trying to figure out, well, how to, you know, make a buck or two. And so we started barbecuing and, and providing catering services. And uh, that was probably about 1979, 80. 81, somewhere around there. Anyway, we've been cooking ever since. He he still does barbecue catering, and uh, uh, we kind of split ways, and he, he stayed with the barbecue catering, and, and then it was a friend of mine, Skip Clark, uh, 
was friends with my wife, Linda, and she had known uh, Skip and Patty for a good number of years. They talked together. And uh, so anyway, we were up in Ridosa one time and went to a chuck wagon cook-off and uh, Richard Farnsworth, uh, the movie actor, and some other guys, Bud Reno and so forth, they had a wagon. We went over and ate with them and it looked pretty cool. You know, everything was historical and the food was, mm, I wouldn't say it was great, but it was different. It was chuck wagon food. It was, you know, off the campfire and uh, decided that was pretty cool. And then we went back the next year and there was a guy from uh, Jim Shirley from Lubbock area or somewhere. He had a big fancy, nice wagon and we ate with them. And, and I remember Skip and I were sitting over, <laughs> we were really sitting over there on the log, like a bump on a log. And I said, Skip, we can do this. He said, what do you mean? Cause we had said that before when we were, <laughs> we were doing dune buggies one time and I said, Skip, let's, let's do some dune buggies. So we built dune buggies. So here we are again. So he said, well, okay. So anyway, it was shortly after that, I started looking for a, a wagon and I found one with, uh, with the El Paso connection out here. And I bought a wagon from, from him that came out of Veracruz, Mexico. It was, it was being used as an old coffee wagon to haul coffee back and forth to the, to the market. And I, and I outfitted it with a chuck box and so forth. And we started cooking and we cooked our first cook off in Ridosa and no, 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 back up there. Our first one was in Odessa. Uh, it was about 1980, 96, I believe. And, uh, and then the next one was in Ridosa and just Skip and I, and oh boy, did we not know what we were doing. But we managed to get it, and we fed 50 people, and we were so tired when that was over with. I don't think I've ever been as tired in my, all my life, both mentally and physically. It was just really something else. But we got through it, and uh, uh, we cooked chuck wagon competitions for years and years. And uh, first, that first cook-off in Ridosa, golly, it was, it was fantastic. Uh, and... I found out later uh, there was a guy in Gene Archer, Oklahoma, that was putting out a, a newsletter. It was like a newspaper, actually. And uh, I saw something in there where there was a picture of a guy named Eddie Sandoval. And I said, and I called the guy that was the editor and I said, Do you know this Eddie Sandoval? He said, Yeah, I'm sorry, I do. <laughs> he said, Why? And I said, I think that may be the same guy I went to college with. And he said, said, really? And I said, where is he from? Brady or, or down there close to, to San Angelo? He said, yeah, that's him. Well, Eddie and I were in the same department, industrial arts, and he was our go-to guy. He was so brilliant that whenever we had a question on a project or whatever it was we were doing, we would go to Eddie to, uh, to get the answer. And I mean, and I still do. I talk to Eddie uh, on the phone probably every other day, still to this day. But uh, anyway, I got back with, got in touch with Eddie and come to find out we had been at a couple of chuck wagon cook-offs at the same time. And we didn't even know that each other, that we were there. And the last time I had seen him was probably 30 something years ago when we went together up in Red River, New Mexico fishing. That was kind of a, when he graduated and I was about to graduate and that sort of thing. And then we just lost track of each other. And, and uh, 30 something years ago, but later, the chuck wagon got us back together and, and we've been pretty tight ever since. Um, doing those, those events, or whether it was competition cooking or others, there's always been funny things happened or, uh, <laughs> talking about Red Oaks, there was a, there was a fellow that came through the line and I apologize to you, sir, if you're watching this, but, uh, he came through the line and there's, you know, 50, 60 people in line. And here's this guy, he comes through and, and he got his plate and there's the first person puts 
whatever it was, beans. And then the next person puts potato salad and the beans and the potato salad touched. And I looked over at him and he went, ooh. And I thought he was kidding. And then we put the meat on and the meat touched one of them. And he went, oh my God. And I looked at him and I said, what? He said, you don't like them touching? He said, oh, hell no. And I went, took that plate and I went, Phew. I said, well, here's another plate. Get back there in line and we'll get you something else. <laughs> he went, <laughs> it was kind of funny. We were, we were kind of tired by that time. So we went to take a bunch of guff. So anyway, we sent him on his way, but he did come on back through the line. We were, we got them all separated and they didn't touch and so forth. But, that was a funny thing. Uh, one of the times we were down there with Glenn, I talked about the tortillas blowing away. It was uh, uh, it was December, and it was twelve twenty seven at night. I mean, I, I remember it just like it was yesterday. The wind started. It was like not blowing, and then it was blowing fifty miles an hour at twelve twenty seven. And I heard it, and then I was, God, we were sleeping in a little flimsy tent. And so I went out there, and everything was blowing. I mean, anything that wasn't tied down was blowing. And we had a big old, I don't know, 16 by 24 enclosed tent for the hunters to come in. And that thing was just going crazy. And I finally hollered at Skip, and I said, Skip, I need some help. And we're in our long johns and it's dropped from, I don't know, probably 30 degrees in 30 minutes. And we're out there trying to hold on to the thing to keep it from blowing away. And then Glenn finally gets up and joins us after quite some time, he was smarter than we were, but it destroyed, it ripped up all of our canvas. And, and it, <laughs> the next day we got up and there was a barbed wire fence over there about Oh, I don't know, 50 yards away. We had paper towels and they just like, you know, like a toilet paper roll. And there was paper on every bush out there in that desert and gloves. And I mean, it would turn over, you know, a 16 inch Dutch oven that weighs, I don't know, 30, 40 pounds with food in it. And they were, you know, lids were blown, pots were blown, dishes and, and, uh, and I remember Rusty, the, the outfitter, uh, some of the hunters came and said, are they gonna have breakfast for us? We'd usually have breakfast for them about 5.30. And he said, I don't know, but I damn sure wouldn't go over there and ask them. <laughs> and sure enough, we didn't have breakfast at 9.30, I mean at 5.30, but we finally got things back together and, and enough to where we could build a fire. And I think it was about nine o'clock, 9.15, that we started making the the burritos with the sausage and eggs. And then they came around to, after they had already been out hunting and, and so forth. But uh, that was one heck of a storm that uh, we we got through it, but it was it was not fun. It was a nice experience and memory uh, to think about it. But uh, yeah, uh, there were a couple of girls that joined us, Skip and I up in Anthony and uh, we were cooking hoe cakes. Hoe cakes are what they called, uh, some people call corn dodgers, but you just take uh, some some corn and some flour and you can mix it with liquid, whether it be coffee or water or anything you've got. And it makes a little paste and you can kind of make a little pancake with it. I don't know if that was Anthony. Yeah, it was Anthony. There was another time in Redosa that it happened when it was raining, but this was in, in Anthony, Texas. There was They were having a little festival. So we had this big old 17-inch Dutch oven lid, and uh, these two girls, uh, <laughs> they were getting their feet wet, literally. Uh, Meredith Abarca, Arbarca. A barca, I'll get it right in a minute, and Lucy West, and uh, they came and joined us, and uh, it was raining so hard. I, I, I try to keep from using too many adjectives there, but it was raining so hard 
But these little hoe cakes, I was going to explain what the hoe cakes were. The, the people that were picking cotton back in the old days, whenever they wanted to take a break, they would take the head of the, of the hoe off, and it was a big old, big old hoe head with a handle that went through it like that. And they would take that off, they'd build a little fire, and they'd have a, a hoe that was almost that size. So they could cook three or four, five, six little hoe cakes and didn't have to have anything but a little package of flour and, and uh, cornmeal and put some coffee in it. They usually have a little pot of coffee on somewhere and that's what they'd make hoe cakes out of. So we were cooking these up in Anthony and it was raining so hard that even though the Dutch oven lid was hot, you'd put them on there and it was raining so hard it just melted and it was just soup. And uh, we thought, oh my God, we got people everywhere that as soon as it quits raining, they're gonna be over here wanting something hot to eat. So we just take scrape that out on the ground and we managed to devise some, some crazy invention to keep from the water from falling on us. And, and we, had, we had the hoe cakes under here and we were kinda, anyway, we managed to make some hoe cakes, but Lucy and Meredith, they were, they were pretty good troopers, and uh, we did some more stuff with them. They uh, they helped us in, in Ridosa one time at Billy the Kid days up in Lincoln. And uh, in fact, I think that may have been the first time that they joined us. And uh, again, they were the hoe cake captains, and uh, uh, oh, we, got, we got a lot of fun events and things going on up there because we would always cook for a group of about 15 people or so and uh, and then there would be plenty of food left. <laughs> I remember one time I was cooking, I think it was chicken fried steaks. I mean, it was a nice meal. Chicken fried steak, baked potatoes, uh, I don't know, gravy and no telling what, probably peach cobbler. And uh, there was a little lady that came by and I, I saw where we were gonna have plenty of food left. And I said, ma'am, would you like to would you like to eat with it? She said, oh, sure, sure I would. And, and I didn't think anything about it. She left and she came back in a minute and she brought five other people with her. I guess they were family members or whatever. And uh, we had a little, a little donation jar that was sitting there on the table. And, uh, and somebody, she asked someone if it cost, what was it gonna cost? I think this was before she left and brought the five back. So I watched her leave, came back with the five people, and she's thinking all this time, well, it's not going to cost her anything. And, and she saw the donation jar over there, so I guess she got to feeling bad. So she put some money in it. Well, I knew it was kind of premature for the donations because that was going to be for later because this was some people that we had invited and so forth. And But five people or six? So a little bit later, I walked over and there were a bunch of people sitting around where, where we were cooking. And that was sitting up on, on the, the griddle where we were. It, there wasn't anything in the griddle. And I looked over in there and there were two $1 bills in there. And I said, what in the hell is this? And of course, everybody's sitting around. She had, I guess she had already gone. I, I don't really remember if she was there or not. And I reached in there, I said, you gotta be kidding me. And I just threw it over there in the fire. And everybody went, holy <laughs> And anyway, everybody was, they were wanting to go in there and donate some more. And I said, no, 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 no. That, that, I don't know, the lady took advantage of us, you know. We were trying to be nice to her and she goes and invites a whole army to come and eat. But anyway, that was fun. Um, another time, we were cooking down in Hondo, Texas. Skip Clark and me and Steve Woods. And, oh, I got, I got to tell you a story about Wendell Walker, a friend of mine from that I taught in high school. Uh, he and I have a little air conditioner business, but he had, uh, I'd invite him to come over and help us. And he said, sure, I'm lucky. Oh, yeah. So this was, you know, you start a day in a competition about 4.30 or 5 o'clock. And this was about 
nine thirty or ten o'clock in the morning. I looked over and window was <laughs> asleep underneath the oak tree. I said, hey, window, get us off. What, what are you doing, bud? We got another six, eight hours to go. <laughs> and after it was over, he says, man, I tell you what, when you get ready to do this again next year, don't freaking call me. <laughs> he said, this is a whole bunch of work. Anyway, that was fun. Uh, we were cooking down at Hondo, and uh, Skip was was managing the the uh, the peach. No, excuse me. Skip was managing the chicken fried steak, and uh, and I don't remember the exact issue about it, but it was it was something that I told him that I take the 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 meat and dip it in the flour, and then dip it in the uh, sourdough uh, mixture and then go back in the flour. Well, Skip did it backwards and did it, you know, he did it in the sour, whichever way it was. He did it in one and I said do it in the other one, you know. And oh, I hadn't lived that down, but I said, oh, and I chewed, his, chewed on him a little bit and uh, <laughs> we won. <laughs> And every year he hey, you want me to take care of the chicken fried steak? Oh, boy. Anyway, another year. It could have been the same year, because I think it was in Hondo. But it might have been a different year. But anyway, I was cooking two pots. of uh, uh, One was peach cobbler and another one was beans. And it was time to put the chili powder from Hatch Chili Powder. Ooh, ooh, ooh into the beans and you know this is long about you know 11 o'clock 11 30 and we got to serve it in 15 minutes and so i go over there and i get my chili powder and a big old spoon of it and i went Whoop! and it was in the peach gobbler and i thought oh crap so i got a big old spoon and you know how chili powder in liquid it just goes whoosh, like that and i was throwing it all out and, and I finally got the got it in the beans but uh we won the peach cobbler. <laughs> that was a that was a funny one. So every time after that we cooked peach cobbler we'd always take a little bit of chili powder and uh put it in our peach cobbler. Uh you know hatch chili, I'm not, I'm not advocating hatch chili but uh hatch chili is good. Uh we always go up every year, and if we don't go to Hatch, we find it here locally and get the Hatch green chilies, and this year we waited too long. And uh, I ended up having to buy chilies from Mexico and not dissing Hatch, but the chilies from Mexico were extremely good. They, they really were. And, you know, everybody knows Hatch chilies are good, but speaking of chilies from Mexico, we were down doing a thing for the Southwest International Livestock Show and Rodeo. We did a few things for them over the years, and uh, they asked us to take the chuck wagon down on the levee and uh, uh, cook for, they were going to do a uh, herd some longhorns, actually they were corrientes, that they were going to uh, take them down I don't know, I think it was Ed Pfeiffer's roping steers, and they were going to herd them down the levee, you know, and get some local video and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we set up the wagon, and the Border Patrol were there on their on their horses and in uniform, and the Sheriff's Posse, they were all there and mounted and so forth, and we had our wagon set up. It was, I don't know, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, and... Uh, we, we were giving them, I don't know, I know we gave them coffee, I don't know if we gave them anything else or not, but probably did. But anyway, it was really a fun deal, and you know, and I don't have one stinking picture of that, and it would have been really cool, because all of those guys on horseback, and the sheriff's posse, and the border patrol, and everybody was, were standing around, you know, like kind of squatting down, holding their horse back here, and drinking coffee, and it was really a cool thing. And so they went on about their business, and took the Corrientes down down the road and and everybody left, so it was time for us to clean up, and there was me and Skip, 
and maybe somebody else, I, I can't remember exactly. And uh, we were right by the river, the Rio Grande. And uh, the, uh, the, the Zaragoza border check was just right over there. Oh, let me back up just a little bit. <laughs> when I went to find the place, they didn't tell me real carefully how to get down on the levee. So I drove in with my wagon, my big long trailer, and I'm pulling in to the lane of traffic. We're going to wars. And I thought, holy bleep. And I pulled over and stopped. And I said, how the heck do you get to the levee? And he said, it's back over there. And I said, well, I'm sure not going that way. <laughs> and uh, we stopped all the traffic. I don't know how many lanes there were there. <laughs> and I made a big old U-turn right back there. And anyway, we went down to the levee. And it was all over and we were standing there. It was me and Skip and somebody else was helping. And I looked over and there's another fellow that was helping us. And he kind of, you know, in broken, broken English, asked if, he, if we needed any help. And I said, sure. And uh, I didn't think anything about it at first. And we were loading up the trailer, loaded up the wagon. Boy, he was working like a trooper, you know. And, and I thought, where'd this guy come from? And I said, Skip, who is this guy? He said, I don't know. You didn't invite him? I said, no, I've never seen him before in my life. I said, where did he come from? Skip went, I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> he said, nope, I don't think so. And here I am thinking, whoa. And then we loaded up and the guy says, could you give me a ride over here to, to Zaragoza and Alameda? And I'm thinking, yeah, that was about it. That's what I was thinking. And I said, Sh sure. <laughs> so he gets in the pickup with me, and I got my wagon loaded and skips either in front of us or behind me. And I'm going up there by the cemetery, and I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, what have I done? And uh, what if he doesn't get out of my truck whenever I get up there? And anyway, I got up there as close to where Carl Jr. is now. And, and I said, here you go, bud. And he looked over and said, thank you. And he got out. And, <laughs> but I was transporting uh, that day. And I didn't tell anybody about that. <laughs> but that was kind of funny. Down on the levee. And, oh, boy. Uh, yeah, another story. We were down at Sol Ross. Jerry Baird, another guy that I went to college with that I hooked up with after many years. He was in, in front of me as, as well as in front of Eddie. But uh, they invited us to come back and, and cook for the Alumni Association out at this fellow Randy Jackson's house out there off of, uh, out close to the Coconut Ranch and Miter Peak. And we said, sure, we'll bring the wagon out there and we'll cook. Well, at the, that particular time, I had a 27 model T Ford pickup that I turned into a chuck wagon. So we took it out there and we set it out there in front of Randy's house. We had a little fly, oh, I don't know, maybe 12 by 16 or something, pretty small. And it came a rain that like no other rains. And we had a, a big pot about that big and I don't know how many gallons it would hold, but Jerry Baird was fixing the, the chili and the wind was blowing and it was raining so hard that Eddie and I were just trying to dig trenches so that the water wouldn't run through the camp. It would try to run around it. So I was going around trying to anchor all of the canvas down so that the wind and rain wouldn't blow in. And Eddie was digging with the shovel, digging trenches so the water would run around and Jerry was minding the chili. And uh, when it was all over with good Lord, it was that deep in mud and and uh, it didn't slow us down. We had a pretty good time and somebody was playing playing music and everybody was dancing out in the mud and eating chili and having a good time. But boy, it was nasty there for a little while. Uh, what else? Goodness gracious, there's so many stories. Another time, a friend of mine, Jerry Slayton, he's from Afton up in the Panhandle. And he called me and said, Carl, hey, you want to help me cook for... 
some folks out there in El Paso, they're going to do a, an RV deal out there, and they're going to have a good number of folks out there, and I need some help cooking. I said, well, sure. How many are you going to cook for? He said, ah, oh, I think they said 2,600. And I said, well, what? I said, how many? He said, 2,600. I thought, oh, sure, no problem. I said, are you kidding me? He said, no, they're having a big, uh, whatever that big organization is for RVs, uh, Sierra Club, is that what it is? And uh, they had a big rally there. Well, we were getting prepared. There were three wagons, I think, we had there. And we had a whole crew of, I don't know, maybe 16 people or something like that. And... Uh, they came up and said, told Jerry, he said, Jerry, we misfigured. He said, oh, good, thank you. He said, no, 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 no. We need you to cook for, I think it was like 400 or 600 more or something like that. I mean, it was several hundred. He said, 2,600, we cooked 400 more. What difference would it make? Sure. And this was at 8 o'clock at night. And we were fixing to have to do that the next morning, so... He sent somebody to the store and got, I don't know, got off a number of eggs and bacon and so forth. And we had bacon fryers, deep fryers cooking bacon. We had two or three of those going. We had three people cooking eggs. We had a big old thing, must have been a 35-gallon pot that we cooked the coffee in and gravy till it was coming out our ears. And uh, my friend Joy Leos and her mom and and uh, I think her sister helped us on that. And But, oh, my Lord, we started cooking biscuits the night before. We had 16 Dutch ovens, and uh, Brian Fullingham was ahead of the biscuits, and he would cook them till they were just almost done and then set them over. They were had pan liners, so they were in a pan that you put inside the Dutch oven, and he'd set them over on a table and put a kind of a, uh, a little sort of a lid over it. And then all we had to do in the next morning is just put them in the Dutch oven, warm them up, and then serve them. And we had those things stacked on a table that were just stacks of them. And we, honest to God, I don't remember how many biscuits. We fed 20, 2,600 people. And I, I think that was right. And we figured, I think, maybe two biscuits a person. Something like that, or, or maybe it was 2,600 biscuits. I don't know who. It was a whole lot of food. Anyway, we got it done, and uh, and that was one of the scary things. We had uh, Dawn, uh, Jerry's wife, was over in, in one of the other uh, enclosures with the chuck wagon, and uh, we'd been cooking on that stove, and she was doing the dishes over there. And... I don't know if it was me or somebody else came in there. We were through with a, a little propane bottle like you use on your barbecue pit. And somebody just came over and set it in that other one. They didn't know there was a fire in that uh, big stove that sits on the ground that had been really, really hot. And I came back in there a little while later, and I looked over there when I came in the door, and the hose had melted off of that propane bottle. And uh, the the weed burner was just laying there and the hose was already melted. Luckily, the gas had been turned off of the tank. And I looked at that and I didn't know whether to run, scream, call the fire department or what. And uh, I just went over there and grabbed the propane and took it outside and, and squirted it down with water. But it wasn't too far before it was going to blow up. And it scared the... It scared me. <laughs> uh, that was another funny thing. But it, during that deal, I said, Jerry, how are we going to do these biscuits? And he said, oh, we'll, we got it figured out. We got it figured out. And I said, well, what? He said, well, you put, you put eight cups of flour and you put, you know, so much lard and you put so much salt and you put this and that and, and, a, and it's a buttermilk biscuit. And I said, oh, my God. That's pretty expensive. He said, no, no, we're not going to use buttermilk. We're just going to use plain old milk, and we'll use a gallon of milk and a, and a, I think it was a half a cup of vinegar, or maybe a cup of vinegar to a gallon. And that made for, for the buttermilk, and it made it pretty quick. And, boy, there was a whole assembly line of us making up the dough and 
you know, kneading it and cutting them out and, and uh, I don't know. I think that's what we did was cook 26, 2800 biscuits. We must have cooked for 2000, I don't know, cooked for a lot anyway. Um, something that was really special, my, my sister Peggy discovered oh, several years ago, she has since passed, but uh, she said, Wayne, I found a, a caulk brand in the courthouse in Jordanton, which is down south of San Antonio, or east of San Antonio. And I said, really? I said, how'd you find that? And I don't remember the story about how she found it or why she found it or why she was even there looking, but it was the caulk brand, which is basically a, if, it, if you looked at it, it would be a, a C with a line down like that. And it, it uh, spelled, oh, you know what? It's here. That's the brand. And it, that's the C, and if you look at that part, would be the A, that's the L, and that's the K. And she says, I don't know why our great-great-granddad, who had a ranch down there in Atascosa County, would have done a CX for his brand. I said, Peggy, I saw it immediately. I said, that's what they call a, a caulk connected, so it's C-A-L-K. I said, that's the way, that's, that brand spells out our name. He said, Wow. He registered it April 26th, 1876. That's when that brand was registered. And then after she told me that, I re-registered it for, I don't know, three or four years, 10 years, whatever it was. And then I, I didn't do it. I wasn't using it on anything other than, than stuff like this. <laughs> so anything that slows down or is not moving, I'll brand it. So, <laughs> But that brand was was my my great grandfather's Elijah Clayton Cock, and uh, he registered that brand. And that's of course, for those of you that know, that's where all the the trail drives started down in South Texas and right in that area. And uh, I've looked and looked to try to find out any kind of information that I might have from him, and I never could find anything. So. One time I just started writing a journal like I was Elijah Clayton and I was putting together a trail drive and I'm still working on that. But uh, I've got to the point where he's got, got everything ready. He's got the horses ready. He's about to have a baby. Um, you know, he's, he's talked to people that are, are descendants from the Alamo because this obviously this was 1876 and that was only 1836. So there were some people there that we got horses from and I did some research. And anyway, they're just a few months away from starting on the trail drive as far as my journal is concerned, but it's been, been fun writing that. Um, a couple of the, the events, uh, I was talking to my friend one time, John Sullivan lives out in Washington as well as Fort Thomas, Arizona, who recently passed. Uh, but I said, hey, John, we need to do something out here for the ACWA, the American Chuck Wagon Association. He said, what's that? I said, you've got a beautiful place out here in the country, which is, he lives right, right next to the, uh, what is it? The Bureau of Land Management, BLM land. And it's just beautiful desert and it's area out there where uh, Geronimo had a stronghold over there. I think it's called the Black Mountains. And uh, he had a stronghold there as kind of the last holdout before for Geronimo for his demise. But anyway, I said, we need to get a bunch of people out here instead of competition. We'll just invite some chuck wagons to come out. And we'll cook and laugh and giggle and play music and have a good time. And, and we don't have all of the stuff that goes with the competition. And we did. And we started that. And they called it the the hoorah from at Fort Thomas, but we had a great time out there, and and we did it several years, and and met some wonderful wonderful people uh, uh, from all over the country, Idaho, and well, everywhere. But uh, we also did some that were really fun out in Scottsdale, Arizona. One time we were 
were out there with John and and he says, come on, come in early and uh, and help me cook for, for these uh, these special people. And I said, who's special? He said, they're a bunch of TV, act, TV and uh, uh, movie actors. And he began to name them off. And it was, uh, oh, God, I can't even, the Virginian, uh, uh, Trampus, uh, I can't even, no. Uh, Clint, uh, Clint Walker, that was Cheyenne Bodie, uh, and the guy, uh, oh, what was the name that killed John Wayne in the cowboy movie? Uh, I'll think of it in a minute, but I remember going up to him and I say, you know what, for years I've hated you because you killed John Wayne. He said, yeah, I've heard that before. And uh, Bruce Dern, and uh, I said, but not always have I hated you because it was when I realized that you are an actor and you didn't really kill John Wayne that it dawned on me that you were doing such a good job acting that I hated your guts. And he said, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that was pretty neat. But all those guys were coming through our line and we were serving them Dutch oven brisket that, that we've done a number of times that John showed me how to cook. But uh, talking about showing me how to cook, I've got a bunch of recipes that, that I've got here in my little box. And you can see I've got my brand on it again, just, just in case, you know. But this, this box was my, my wife's grandmother, I believe, or great-grandmother. And this, this box was dated 1884. March 21st, I ran, went over it with marker because it was just about to fade out. But at that that's how old this box is. And of course the recipes, some of them are kind of old too. <laughs> this is my mother's Mexican cornbread, uh, jalapeno cornbread recipe that's uh, it's got a lot of writings in the, I don't know if you can see that or not. Maso Manos. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oh, I got, I got, whew, lots of recipes, uh, and one one recipe. In fact, I think there's only one recipe in here that I can't divulge what's in it, and that's because Jerry Baird gave it to me. It's a it's a yeast bread recipe, and the fellow that gave it to him said, "Please don't give it to anybody, or don't share." with it what the ingredients are and he I guess he I cooked it five years before he really told me what was in it and I told him Jerry I says I can't ever get the taste you and Eddie cooked this recipe down at the bull bar it's the first time I ever tasted it and it was so different and uh, he said well here it is and he, he gave me the recipe and and you know and then he said you know this is the you use I think he said milk in it, or, you know, along with other things, obviously. But it was the milk ingredient was the one ingredient that he didn't tell me the truth about. And I tried it with milk. I tried to add sugar. I tried to use buttermilk. I tried to, you know, five years I cooked with that Jerry Baird. Five years. And finally, he gave me the recipe. And I thought, wow. <laughs> wow. And there was one other guy... Uh, I can't think of his name. He's from Las Vegas. And I tasted his yeast bread recipe and I bit into it and I said, ah, I know what's in your bread recipe. And it wasn't his, it was his sister's recipe. And I said, but I know what's in it. He says, you do? Are you sure? I said, I am absolutely sure. But anyway, I wish I could tell you, but that's the one recipe I can't share. Uh, but I've got a recipe from Glenn Benson, uh, one of his, what they call in South Texas, hot hamburger meat. And, uh, ooh, I should have looked it up and see if I can find it. Uh, but I won't look it up. Uh, but it has raw meat, like sirloin, ground sirloin in it. And it has apples and it has uh, citrus. I think lemon or lime, I can't remember and a lot of jalapenos, but you mix all of this stuff together 
and the citrus is what cooks the meat or cures the meat basically and you ask for it down in south texas like in del rio they say anybody sell hot hamburger around here they'll tell you but you ask somebody here in el paso do you have any hot hamburgers what the hell's that you know but you can't believe how good that stuff is it's just a dip like a bean dip except it's hamburger and you know all these other things but that's a really good recipe um he told me not to share it but uh i'm not not going to but anyway uh, glenn is another one that gave me a recipe uh in fact he gave me a lot of recipe gave me a lot of hell along with him but uh, uh pozole it's unlike any pozole i've ever eaten uh and it's it'll feed 50 60 people you start off with with a gallon of hominy a yellow hominy and a gallon of white hominy and if you want to use bacon you can use bacon or if you want to use that's what we usually use you could use sausage and then we put oh gosh all sorts of things bell peppers and onions and celery and and that's chili powder uh and you know you you all know those of you that eat chili or chili powder that you never know what you're going to get so sometimes it might be mild that and the next time it might oh just break out in a cold sweat but that's the way the pozole is is you just never know depending on the chili powder uh but that's a, a good recipe and i've got recipes for oh man uh, my friend jamie cardwell came up and cooked with us one time he cooked pinto beans with us and he put bacon grease bacon and bacon grease and jalapenos and uh onions and some tomatoes and uh and he we won the beans because of his his cooking the beans i mean we yeah we won the bean recipe and there's in a chuck wagon association when you go out and cook you have meat bread beans potatoes and dessert and uh, when i was talking about we were cooking the the cobbler and the beans well that's a whole different thing you got to get all five of those things ready uh for usually in the competition you're going to feed 50 people more or less and you have to be right on time they give you like a, a five minute window or something like that that if it's do it you're supposed to turn in at 11 45 the next guy's going to be turning in at 11 50 and then 50 you know and if you're not there on time you're you're kaput so you don't uh you don't mess up we have been right down at the end i, I remember one time we were cooking yeast bread and uh the yeast was dead or something something happened with the yeast and i was doing everything in the world to try to get the yeast to to rise and i put it in a, you know in a black plastic bag to get it out there so that it would it would start fermenting and it wouldn't do it it wouldn't do it and i mean the time was rocking on and it wasn't going to work and i think we ended up having to do pan de campo because you could do that real quick but i don't know what happened to the bread um the only thing I could think of was the yeast died and, and it just wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna work for us. Uh, there was, a, there was an old boy from Austin by the name of Haven Snow. Uh, we were walking down, they were having a whole bunch of Clydesdales in the, in the cook-off. Uh, they had their Budweiser wagon and they were walking the horses, uh, that early that morning and, walked by old haven's wagon he said hey call, come over here i got something i want you to try i said what he said i got some apple pie i said well, i'm not too crazy about apple pie he said no you'll like this and i said no really thank you haven but I, no no really this is liquid apple pie and it's not like you'd see on moonshiners where they make uh apple pie moonshine but it's made with everclear and I think rum and cinnamon and brown sugar and so forth. And uh, we've made, Steve Woods and I made that one time up in Lincoln on the back of the wagon. And ooh, a bunch of folks that were waltzing around like some, those ants. I mentioned that pan de campo is a, is a bread that's uh, made on the ranches along the, the border here with Texas and, and Mexico and I guess lots of other places. But... That's where I've known it from, and uh, not that I make a lot of pan de campo, but if you go out on a ranch and, and you got a bunch of 
old timers uh, that are that are Hispanic and you know Mexican cowboys, uh, you know, they know what pan de campo is. It's just like a, a staple, and it's like the whole cakes, which are are cornbread and flour. It's just minimal ingredients, and it's the same thing as far as the flour is concerned. There's no cornmeal in it, but it's but it is a uh, the flour and a minimum ingredients like salt and a, a little bit of lard and 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 some liquid. I can't even remember now exactly what's in it. Maybe it has an egg. No, I don't think it has any. But anyway, they make a pond of comp on it, and you just put it in the pan, and it's a great big old, like a great big pancake, but it's, you know, thick. Uh, but they call it pond de campo. Uh, the food is, is really interesting about, uh, as far as how it fits in with a chuck wagon and so forth, and, and I got in, interested and involved with the American Chuck Wagon Association years ago, and I was at the right place at the wrong time, and I got elected president of the association. And uh, during that presidency, uh, we started developing the foods that would be available on a chuck wagon and the methods by which they are cooked. And so we began making guidelines for the food and the fruit prep and things that you wouldn't necessarily have like mayonnaise, you wouldn't have mayonnaise. Now there's a lots of chuck wagons across the country that don't allow you to, to have cheese or put cheese in your menus. And I have not ever figured out why. I honest to God, I wish somebody could tell me because they've had cheese forever. You know, Jesus ate cheese. Uh, why wouldn't you have it on the chuck wagon? Uh, but anyway, but we, we had lots of conversations about that and we had lots of conversation about what would be on a chuck wagon and what would not be on a chuck wagon. And so we began to develop, uh, methods that we would give to competition sites around the country so that we could be consistent if we had a chuck wagon. Uh, competition here in El Paso, if you could go to Brady, Texas, it would be the same. You would have the same criteria so that you wouldn't have to uh, go back and reinvent the wheel just because somebody else wants it a little different. And we put out these guidelines and we thought that the best way to show people how it was done was to have a chuck wagon cook-off that was uh, sponsored by the American Chuck Wagon Association. So we decided to have it down in Fredericksburg, Texas, and we were led to believe that uh, we would have a lot of money uh, through the help of the people in that area to put the show together, and it didn't tur turn out just exactly that way, and we had to pull back on what it was that we wanted to do just so we could have it, and it didn't, didn't work very well, and we were getting a lot of dissension among the our own ranks about, well, why are you doing this and why are you doing that? And if you said it was this way, why are you doing it this way? And it was, we did it for two years and then we just decided it wasn't worth it, that we were going to invest our time in the historic aspect of the chuck wagon and the cooking and the implements used thereof. You can look in, uh, in the Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth and there are lots and lots, hundreds of pictures of chuck wagons, but there are very, very few, in fact, rare pictures of a chuck wagon on a trail drive. Most all of the ones, near, all of the ones except for rare case are on a ranch. And the wagon that they would have on a ranch is way different than what they would have on a trail because a trail, you would have to feed about 16 cowboys and they would have big bedrolls that would be about that. There would be 16 of them. And you had to have enough flour, uh, coffee, all of that stuff. Say if they left South Texas, they might go as far as possibly Fort Worth before they could get more supplies. And they only travel about 10 to 15 miles a day. So it takes a good long while. And they would be traveling from San Antonio all the way up to you know, South Dakota, 
so they would be on the trail for months. And uh, but that the, developing the historical aspect of the chuck wagon is is what got us interested in as far as the ACWA is concerned. And uh, then somebody said they're going to have a deal down at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio uh, to thank the the cowboys. I mean the warriors, the the military people that had served in in the military, and we wanted to gather together and feed them. So we gathered together, I don't know, 16, 18 wagons at Fort Sam Houston and we set fed like four or 5,000 people uh, that were there, uh, some injured, some not injured, uh, but uh, all sorts of military folks that were very appreciative and, and we had such a good time. We, we cooked anything that we wanted to cook, everything that we wanted to cook. We had, I don't know how many Dutch ovens I think we had six or eight Dutch ovens just cooking cobblers. And uh, and I, I remember, oh my goodness, Marcus Reed and his wife and daughter and, and Steve Woods and Eddie Sandoval and oh my goodness gracious, 16, 18 people on our cooking crew. And Eric, Eric Barrett, he, uh, Bear, Eric Brasino, he said, man, I don't know why I come out here and cook with you guys. Everything you got is heavy or hot or stings you. <laughs> and then he says, I just love it. <laughs> but uh, we went down there and cooked for those guys, for guys and gals for two years. And boy, talk about rewarding. Uh, it was it was quite something. But American Chuck Wagon Association has got a website and they tell all about chuck wagons and, and how to put on competitions and... Uh, uh, there's there's all sorts of things you you know if you wanted if you were interested in cooking on a chuck wagon and wanted to learn how you could go talk to Kent Rollins who lives up close to the the Panhandle of Texas up on the Red River and uh, he will cook with you for a week and you live in a teepee and you'll cook three meals a day and you'll learn how to cook those three meals and you pay a I don't know how much you pay it. Uh, but it, he does that every year and he and his wife do that and they are super people and you learn from the very core about how to cook with a dutch oven and firewood and and so forth and uh the chuck wagon itself is just pretty cool and like like skip and i sitting on that stump one day i said hey skip we can do this and that was i don't know what 25 30 years ago but here we go. That's a story. I'm sticking to it. Well, I was going to tell you another story that popped into my head. It was about, we were up in Redosa and a guy named Scotty called me and he says, hey, we, we're with RFD Food Network Channel and so forth. And we want to do a, do a segment up there at uh, Redosa and kind of, kind of a hands-on sort of deal. And I said, well, sure, Scotty, come on. Scotty Cobb, I think is his name. And I said, sure, come on. We'll we'll do whatever you want to do. So he comes up there, and they had their camera crew and their lighting crew and the and the gal that was the the one that was holding the microphone and, and in the camera, uh, camera shots. She was, uh, I'm not sure what her title was, but uh, she was very excited about it. And uh, so we were going to make some uh, uh, some dessert. We were going to make kolaches. And heck, I'd never made kolaches before. In fact, I didn't even come up with the idea until he called and said we were going to do something. So I thought, well, we need to do something a little different. So I can't think of the girl's name that was doing it, but uh, uh, we decided to do fruit kolaches. And we were using that same bread recipe that Jerry Baird gave us as the basis. And then we, I think we had to use fruit. Uh, I think we had to use apricot. And uh, so she came in and I said, well, what do you want to do? She said, well, I want to really get into it. And I said, well, you got those gorgeous fingernails. Do you really want to get in here and, and knead the dough and so forth? She was a pretty nice looking girl. And I said, do you really want to do that? And she said, oh yeah, I do. I said, okay. And, uh, so we had this, we're cooking kolaches for 50, 60 people, whatever it was. 
And so we had this great big old tub, and she's in there kneading that dough and doing it like that. And we were putting them out there, putting the thumb in it, putting the apricots in it. And boy, they were filming, and she was having a good time. We were laughing and giggling. And uh, boy, she was excited, you know. And uh, so we got it all done, and uh, and we fed everybody. And this was at noon, and I think the awards were at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And, so I, I asked her, and I said, well, are y'all going to stick around? She said, oh, yeah, we're going to stick around. Well, she just knew we were going to win this thing slam dunk. Well, I thought we might, too. <laughs> Actually, it was pretty good grub. And uh, so they announced, you know, they, they announced uh, whatever it was, fourth place. You know, they didn't call us. <laughs> Third place, they didn't call us. <laughs> yes. Second place. All right, we got this. And then they called first place and it was somebody else. <laughs> we, <laughs> we couldn't believe it. I looked over out of the corner of my eye. They were filming all of this. And I swear to goodness, I thought she was going to cry. <laughs> she was more upset than we were because she really thought that was a winner. And, and we did too. And you know, that's that's like the cobbler I talked about with the chili powder. <laughs> you know, I didn't think we'll get anything we want. Whenever you think that you're not going to win, you put together some really good food. Sometimes you think that's the best I can do, and then you don't get anything. So you just never know. But that was a funny one. We we made some really special kolaches, and she worked her little hands to the bone doing it. And she thought they were going to be a RFD slam dunk and nothing. <laughs> But back to reality, you know, thanks.